Uh, so Joseph, and you've seen him at various times during the, the summer school and symposium, and has been instrumental in putting together not only the program, but also uh, the research that goes on in MIP. And we hope we've been able to communicate what's been going on in MIP uh, over the last four years or so. Uh, but Joseph is a professor here at BBI and in, also in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Biopathology, Pathobiology, uh, which is part of the vet school. Uh, he's director of NIMBL, the Nutritional Immunology and Molecular Medicine Laboratory, which is a $12 million program that combines computational approaches with preclinical and clinical experimentation uh, to transition new biological knowledge into safer and more effective medicines for human diseases. Uh, he's also director of MIP, which we've talked about again, one of the, the MIP centers modeling immunity for biodefense. He has a DVM from Autonomous University of Barcelona and a PhD in nutrition and immunology from Iowa State University. Uh, he began as an assistant professor here at Virginia Tech in 2003 and has risen through the ranks to his current positions, has research interests in computational immunology, nutritional immunology, characterizing novel therapeutic targets, uh, and developing novel anti-inflammatories and host-targeted therapeutics. And his title, and I always have to look because in most cases it's changed from what I've seen in the program, but it's uh, going to be, and your title isn't on there, so we're modeling, um, oh there we go, modeling immunity to enteric pathogens. Thank you, Dave. And for those of you who have been here, uh, you will have seen some of the slides. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to deliver today's presentation with a slightly different angle from what I used uh, in the scale-up classroom a few days ago. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, MIP. Um, MIP in more broad terms uh, from what we discussed um, on Thursday. Modeling immunity to enteric pathogens, as you know, is um, project within a larger program at NIAID, Modeling Immunity for Biodefense. And MIP specifically integrates four uh, major components, a computational modeling component, a bioinformatics component, an immunology experimentation component, and an education component. And I think that you have been participants of the education component in these week-long activities, starting with the summer school and evolving today, uh, which is the, the finale of, of this education part. Uh, MIP is organized uh, with these four pillars, and those four pillars provide support for research, immunology research, uh, looking at the mechanisms of immunoregulation underlying immune responses to enteric pathogens. Our primary proof of concept pathogen, and we discussed that on Thursday, is Helicobacter pylori. And uh, I define that as a pathogen. I think I raised the controversy, is it a pathogen or is it not? And in some cases it may be, in other situations it may behave more as a commensal bacterium. Uh, we also explore uh, Clostridium difficile and the host responses to Clostridium difficile, as well as Enterovergative E. coli. And we do that, uh, as I said, by combining computational and experimental approaches. I will not belabor on this uh, picture, but basically what this slide shows is the structure of the mucosal immune system, which is a hierarchical, uh, complex, uh, subtly well-communicated system with two major components, the inductive sites where the immune responses are initiated and the effector sites where the immune responses take place. Our computational and mathematical models build on the basic architecture of the mucosal immune system. And if you remember, we've seen uh, a model uh, that Adi Carbo presented on CD40 cell differentiation. CD40 cells are key components of the mucosal immune system. They are represented here in the lamina propria. You may remember that the story presented by Adrian on uh, Monday was uh, studying the plasticity between regulatory T cells and T helper uh, 17 cells and how we integrated uh, computational modeling, specifically an orbit differen differential equations based model with in vitro and in vivo experimentation through adoptive transfer models of colitis uh, to understand changes in this plasticity and to identify novel opportunities for therapeutic development. There was a talk uh, by uh, Cassandra Philipson on epithelial cell uh, and the role of epithelial cells in uh, modulating immune responses. Today, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, 
Dark Laufenberger also uh, discussed at length uh, the role of epithelial cells and how TNF uh, alpha modulates epithelial cell survival or apoptosis. We have also developed models of macrophage differentiation, which we have not presented in the summer school. And we've developed uh, tissue level models that represent the lumen, the epithelium, uh, and the lamina propria, as well as the uh, relevant uh, inductive sites. Uh, in, the case, in the case of H. pylori infection, we are representing as inductive sites the gastric lymph nodes in the case of IBD or Clostridium difficile infection, we are representing the model as inductive sites, the mesenteric lymph nodes. So uh, the, the take home message from this slide and, and the comments I made in relation to this slide is that we, during the first uh, three, three and a half years of this program, have built the pieces that allow us to begin to integrate with uh, develop uh, well calibrated models of CD40 cell differentiation, macrophage differentiation, both ODE based as well as agent based models of uh, tissue level responses uh, following Helicobacter pylori infection. And we hope now to integrate those models in a meaningful uh, environment through a multi scale modeling platform that we continuously develop. Um, during the last uh, five days, you've been exposed to a very mature tool that was developed at DBI uh, 10 years ago and we continue to support and develop complex pathway simulator and you've also been exposed to a new tool that uh, modeling immunity to enteric pathogens has established uh, called enteric immunity simulator which is an agent based modeling platform and uh, so we use this modeling uh, platform to study the interactions between uh, gene expression, diet inflammation and immunity, the microbiome in the context of infectious disease, but is also applicable to studying immune-mediated diseases as well as chronic inflammatory diseases uh, such as type 2 diabetes and obesity. Uh, given the inflammatory pathogenesis and the role of immune cells infiltrating the white adipose tissue and contributing to um, insulin resistance and other uh, chronic processes. So I'll, I'll have a couple of short use cases and I'll, I'll try not to use the entire hour uh, today. I, I'm sure that uh, being the last talk, we don't want to spend the entire 60 minutes, but the two use cases will be representative of uh, what we have discussed over the last few days. One of them is modeling immune responses to Helicobacter pylori and the other one will be a short description of modeling immune responses to enteronegative E. coli, uh, the causative agent of persistent diarrhea in the U.S. and worldwide. So, uh, why H. pylori? We have a high prevalence of H. pylori infection. About 50% of the world's population is infected with H. pylori. There's extreme differences in geographic distribution, as you can see, and as I alluded earlier this week, the uh, rates in the U.S. and Europe are going down, and this is due to the interventions and decisions, policy decisions that uh, National Institutes of Health in the U.S. and other agencies in Europe have made when someone is diagnosed to be Helicobacter uh, pylori positive, the course of action is to treat with antibiotics. Other parts of the world are uh, more heavily colonized by H. pylori, about 80-90% in Africa, 80-90% in South America. And, uh, and what does this colonization mean? In some cases, colonization with H. pylori means presence of duodenal ulcers. In some cases, it means uh, more severe disease uh, involving gastric lymphoma or uh, gastric cancer. And so, do we have uh, uh, a causal relationship in, in which everyone infected with H. pylori develops gastric cancer? Uh, do we have that similar relationship in terms of everyone uh, infected with H. pylori developing gastric lymphoma? Uh, no. Uh, actually, it's about 15% of those infected that will uh, develop those severe pathologies. And why the remaining uh, people do not become uh, um, severely seen due to H. pylori infection, it is not well understood. Uh, but there's a suspicion that there's obviously a host pathogen interaction going on, and in some cases the immune response may be contributing to the pathogenesis. Um, why would we not want to eradicate H. pylori? And the reason for that is that in some cases H. pylori is beneficial. 
uh, there's an inverse correlation between H. pylori prevalence and the rate of overweight and obesity. And there have been recent publications pointing that out in humans. Uh, we published a couple of years ago that H. pylori colonization of the BDB mice, that's a model of type 2 diabetes, uh, ameliorates uh, glucose co uh, homeostasis, and it also had some effects on weight. Um, and the mechanism by which we suspected that happened uh, was related to modulation of uh, gastric hormones that regulate society or that regulate uh, glucose metabolism. So there's this balance of H. pylori being a pathogen that can cause cancer, but a potentially beneficial symbiont that perhaps we may not want to eradicate. And so what's the approach that we are using to study H. pylori infection? Uh, this is a different representation from what I showed in my second slide is a computational representation using Cell Designer, one of the softwares that you uh, learn uh, how to utilize during this week. And this representation uh, contains uh, four main compartments, a luminal area and epithelial layer, which represents the monolayer of epithelial cells. I think I mentioned when I was providing figures related to the immune system, and particularly the mucosal immune system, that the epithelial layer in the intestine is about 300 square meters. And so we can pave several uh, tennis courts, and this is replaced, uh, replaced and replenished about every two uh, to three days. And, um, and so uh, there's some dynamics going on at the epithelium. There's uh, complex dynamics going on in the lamina propria, where we have uh, lymphocytes, uh, macrophages, dendritic cells. And those macrophages, dendritic cells, uh, uh, T cells, originate from the inductive site. And in the case of H. pylori, what we are representing is the gastric lymph node. And so we've built a computational model of mucosal immune responses during H. pylori infection, um, both an ordinary differential equation-based model as well as an agent-based model uh, constructed upon the ANISI platform that I'll discuss uh, in greater detail uh, later. Um, upon uh, calibration of this model, what we have found, uh, and I showed this slide earlier, this is the sensitivity analysis results for the agent-based model and for the uh, ODE model, that at the beginning of the infection, uh, Sudipobacter pylori is the major contributor to epithelial cell damage. At the later stages of infection, at the chronic stages, about uh, six to seven weeks post-infection, we have T-helper 17 and T-helper 1 cells contributing primarily to that epithelial cell damage, which raises the question as to whether H. pylori is exactly what we want to treat, or we want to treat, in some cases, the underlying immune response to H. pylori. Um, and it appears that in the chronic stages, that's exactly what we want to do. We've also uh, developed uh, knockout systems uh, to study what happens when we delete uh, one of the uh, proteins that uh, has been involved in um, type 2 diabetes and has been involved in the maintenance of glucose tolerance, uh, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. The title of the paper that I showed earlier, linking uh, H. pylori infection with improvement of type 2 diabetes, pointing towards a bar gamma dependent mechanism of modulation of immune responses and modulation of glucose homeostasis. And I could go over this uh, um, graph, but I want you to take a look at uh, subpanel E, where there's a prediction suggesting that uh, in the wild type mice, there's greater levels of luminal H. pylori when compared to the PPAR gamma null mice. We, uh, this was the beginning of uh, a new line of investigation in our laboratory under the MIP program that uh, compared in vivo what happened when we infected H. pylori uh, with H. pylori well-type mice versus mice that lack P. bar gamma in myeloid cells. And this is a histopathological um, a slide of uh, well-type of the stomach of well-type mice, and this is from myeloid-specific uh, P. bar gamma null mice infected with H. pylori. There's an uh, increased mucosal thickness and leukocytic infiltration, which you can probably not see at this uh, magnification. But these histopathological changes correlated with uh, a dramatic decrease in bacterial loads. We followed um, uh, several groups of mice for over six months following infection with Helicobacter pylori. And you can see that the levels of H. pylori following infection in the stomach in the wild-type mice were uh, significantly higher 
than those lacking uh, PBAR gamma in macrophages. And we also showed that uh, the, the macrophages had uh, some um, H. pylori in the, uh, cytos at the cytosolic level. Um, looking, uh, so the previous slide was in vivo results, this slide is uh, in vitro results. We uh, decided to set up co-culture studies with macrophages and Helicobacter pylori. And uh, we uh, examine the level of um, H. pylori over time. And what you can see is that, again, the well-type macrophages had higher levels of H. pylori in the cytosol and or in the phagosome uh, when compared to mice uh, lacking uh, P. bar gamma. We also included a treatment, uh, GW9662. This is an antagonist of P. bar gamma. Uh, it blocks uh, the activity of PBAR gamma and it doesn't allow signaling. And GW9662 uh, treated macrophages behave very similarly as expected as the um, tissue specific, the, as, as the PBAR gamma null uh, macrophages. And this is, was uh, correlated with increased expression of INOS, a gene that you would expect to see in the context of uh, M1 uh, macrophage. So we, we have a phenomenon. And, uh, and we didn't fully understand what was going on in the context of um, um, PPAR gamma deletion following H. H. pylori infection. And we wanted, this was a good opportunity to uh, utilize uh, transcriptomic analysis of, uh, of those macrophages at different time points. Uh, this is the pipeline that we have been showing over the last week where we use um, human or animal data in this case uh, from uh, geodata sets, but in this specific situation we generated our data. So we um, cultured the macrophages uh, for uh, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 uh, hours with H. pylori. We collected those co-cultures, we isolated the RNA, and we ran uh, RNA sequencing. With that RNA we utilized uh, the Galaxy pipeline that you've been exposed to. Uh, to analyze uh, those uh, data sets and uh, we use uh, ingenuity pathway for network inference and to characterize both canonical and predictive pathways by which uh, H. pylori may be modulating innate responses or metabolism related genes or, um, and also we wanted to see what was the difference between uh, wild type macrophages and P. bar gamma null macrophages following uh, H. pylori infection so what IPA will give us is a static network. Uh, we, it's, it's, it's a network, it's not necessarily a model with the dynamics. So uh, we utilize this data uh, after some pruning uh, to build uh, an SVML uh, compliant network uh, using Cell Designer. And then we uh, imported uh, that network to Copasi uh, for sensitivity analysis. Um, those are some of the initial results from uh, the RNA-seq analysis. One of the pathways that was differentially, uh, that was modulated by H. pylori uh, infection was the, was the super pathway of cholesterol biosynthesis. There was also a nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species uh, pathway that was upregulated following H. pylori infection. And you can see that the pattern of regulation following infection was different in wild type uh, red line versus uh, PPAR gamma null uh, macrophages. Another pathway that uh, came up at the top of our analysis was the metabolic response pathway. You may be familiar with the uh, oxidative phosphorylation. It's a key pathway required to uh, generate energy, uh, produce ATP. And uh, there are five complexes that are located in the inner uh, mitochondrial membrane. And those uh, complexes or genes linked to those complexes were upregulated over time following infection with H. pylori. And we saw differences depending on uh, wild type or uh, P. bar gamma null uh, macrophages, suggesting that there's a modulation of metabolism at the cholesterol level and at the oxidative phosphorylation level following H. pylori infection. Of, uh, of those cells. And this is the, the pathway that we built in terms of uh, innate responses uh, to H. pylori. At two uh, time points, we have many more time points, but because we wanted to be able to calibrate our models uh, really well, 
but briefly, what uh, this is showing is a, a node uh, that is basically an F kappa B related, uh, so the, the kind of pathway that would be involved in um, activation of uh, inflammatory transcription, uh, a node that contains NLRs, uh, specifically NLRC5, uh, NOT1, NLRP3, NLRX1, a node that con contains the toll-like receptors, toll-like receptor 4, toll-like receptor 9, uh, toll-like receptor 2, uh, a group of cytokines where uh, significantly upregulated TNF-alpha, IL-10, IL-1-beta, IL-6, IL-1-alpha, and then this uh, was linked to a series of transcription factors that we would expect to see in the context of a viral infection. Uh, STAT1, IRF7, IRF3, and a group of other genes that we would expect to see in the context of MHC class 1 presentation, um, MHC class 1, TAP, and so on. And, and the, the level of our regulation went up over time. As I say, I'm, I'm showing two time points. So, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we would not expect that a bacterial infection would induce a gene pattern that is consistent with type 1 presentation, or we would not expect this profiling uh, of uh, interferon-related gene transcription factors that we would see, for instance, in influenza infection. And so what that suggested is, and that's consistent with uh, some results in the literature, that H. pylori has a dual role, a primary role of, uh, as an extracellular uh, bacterium, but also a role as an intracellular bacterium where some components may be accessing the cytosol. So not only uh, as, as a part of the phagosome and presented through MHC class 2, but potentially also presented through MHC class 1. And uh, we are very interested in, in validating, the, validating this over the next um, few months. Um, as I said, the, the pathway that we obtain from IPA is in reality not a model. It doesn't have the dynamics. And so um, we um, were able to transfer that um, static network into a cell designer SVML compliant diagram. Uh, we built a cell designer plugin to facilitate this uh, transfer of, of information. And uh, therefore, we build a, a computational and mathematical model that we then imported into COPASI. And uh, we assessed that the fitting was appropriate, and, and we had a, a fitting, this experimental data, and this is the model fitting. And then we run a sensitivity analysis on um, NLRX1, one of the genes uh, that was in the cluster of not lab receptors. And we wanted to assess how changes in NLRX1 would change other um, uh, molecules within the system. And as you can see with the darker representation, and I'm sorry, I guess the, the last ones are, it's so dark that it's not uh, readable, but what it shows is from top to bottom, the genes that were uh, more sensitive uh, to NLRX1. We have IRF3, uh, IRF7, STAT1, MXC class 1, TRAF2. So those would be the kinds of genes that we would expect to be involved in a, a viral signaling cascade. Uh, there was also an intimate link between NLRX1 and inter interferon signaling in the context of H. pylori infection. That was counterintuitive. We would not have expected that uh, just based on the existing theoretical framework of H. pylori infection and MHC class 1 genes were, uh, were altered as well. Going back to the ingenuity and looking at the MHC class 1 pathway, there was definitely um, an upregulation of MHC plus one uh, related genes. And, um, and so in terms of MHC plus one presentation, um, what you expect uh, when, when antigens are presented through uh, MHC plus one as opposed to MHC plus two is that uh, the MHC plus one presentation will lead to CD8 responses. And there are no reports, or there were no reports in the literature demonstrating that H. pylori infection would induce uh, CD8 responses. Um, we tried to determine whether we could find CD8 responses in mice following H. pylori infection. Unfortunately, we were not very successful in, in doing that. I think we've been, um, as Adri showed in his presentation on Tuesday, we've been very effective um, infecting mice and inducing a CD4 response, demonstrating that H. pylori infection induces Th1 cells, uh, Th17 cells, uh, concomitant re regulatory response, both at the mucosal sites 
as well as systemically, but we have not seen a CDN response. Uh, I, I have a bias. Uh, over the years, we've used the, the PIC model uh, because I believe that PICs uh, have a, a enhanced translational value. They are closer to humans than mice. And uh, in the past, we developed uh, a PIC model of inflammatory bowel disease that was very predictive of, um, of behavior of new therapeutics when uh, those therapeutics would advance uh, to human testing. So we decided to develop a PIC model of Helicobacter pylori infection. And um, it requires some optimization, but this slide is showing just the piece of information that is linked to the previous uh, story that I explained to you. Uh, we infected pigs over a period of 56 days with uh, Helicobacter pylori. We had three groups of pigs, some uninfected, infected with H. pylori J99, uh, which is an African strain of H. pylori, or infected with H. pylori SS1. And then we followed over time uh, the patterns of expression by flow cytometry as uh, Dr. Laufenbarger um, uh, mentioned uh, this morning um, of different cell subsets. Here, what I'm show showing is CD8 positive T cells, uh, CD16 positive cells, uh, natural killer cells. And what you can see is that about uh, day 28 post infection, uh, H. pylori is inducing an increase in CD8 positive T cells. And at later stages of infection, there was also a detectable increase in natural killer cells. This phenomenon would be li linked to MHC class 1 presentation if we were unsure as to whether those uh, CD8 positive cells had a regulatory phenotype. In other words, would those cells be producing IL-10 or would they be producing the kind of molecules that you would expect in the context of cytotoxic responses? We examined uh, levels of expression of perforin, granzyme A and granzyme B. Those are molecules involved in cytotoxicity and there was an upregulation of perforin after uh, 35 days post-infection, which, which was sustained until we uh, euthanized these pigs at day 49. We saw a transient increase in granzyme A and uh, granzyme B. Um, in addition, if we look at the um, immunohistochemistry, we see the location of H. pylori in these stomachs of pigs. Uh, we see that most of H. pylori in, um, in a healthy state, and that would be the same in humans and, and in mice, although in mice it's, it's harder to see, but the, we've developed ways to, to uh, better optimize the immunohistochemical analysis in the mouse model. Most of the H. pylori is uh, free-floating in the mucus layer. We have goblet cells, those goblet cells produce mucus, and H. pylori lives in that mucus. And it can get closer to the epithelial cells, um, as uh, Doc mentioned earlier, in addition to the mucus, we have M um, uh, MCP1 that is being released, which, uh, of course, it may be beneficial for the epithelium. It can also attract uh, immune cell subsets, particularly myeloid cells, into the lamina propria. This is a higher magnification of H. pylori free-floating in the mucus layer. But what I want to show you is that in vivo, we're able to find H. pylori inside myeloid cells, and we don't know whether those are macrophages or dendritic cells, and uh, that would again be in line with uh, our um, hypothesis that H. pylori behaves intracellularly. We know that H. pylori can be found in epithelial cells, uh, and we believe that its role in uh, macrophages and dendritic cells may be key to the pathogenesis of uh, H. pylori infection and may also be key to the persistence of H. pylori in the mucosal uh, barrier. If we look at NLRX1 expression, since we assess the sensitivities of NLRX1 in our model, we compared in well-type mice, uh, uh, sorry, in well-type macrophages versus p gamma deficient macrophages, what were the levels of um, NLRX1? And you can see that following infection, there was a dumb regulation of NLRX1, and the pattern of expression was different in p gamma deficient macrophages when compared uh, to the wild-type macrophages. The differences were greater, and also the uh, standard deviation was slightly uh, greater. If we look at validation of the role of NLRX1 in the H. pylori system, we acquired uh, NLRX1 uh, knockout mice, and then we looked at um, how much H. pylori uh, wild-type mice versus NLRX1 knockout mice had in that uh, stomach 
in this case, few weeks post infection, and we hope to generate data uh, in the more chronic stages of the infection. And you can see that NLRX1 uh, deficiency causes uh, a suppressed levels of H. pylori loads following infection. If we go um, in vitro and we create a bone marrow derived uh, macrophages um, from wild type mice or NLRX1 uh, knockout mice, we can see that uh, the the deficiency of NLRX1 causes uh, a decrease uh, in, um, in H. pylori uh, loads. So um, we are still, some of that is a work in progress, but we've used computational modeling in, in addition to experimentation in vitro, in mouse models, and in pig models uh, to demonstrate that H. pylori infection uh, modulates two phases of the innate immune response pathways that seem to intersect with metabolism. And that's another opportunity for the multi-scale model. We have our proteins, we have our genes, and those proteins um, and the genes that encode those proteins are able to modulate metabolites that will, will, will be able to influence the immune response. That's a, a new module that can be included in the future in our ANISI modeling platform. Another conclusion is that NLRX1 regulates host responses to H. pylori infection in macrophages. We identified an inverse relationship between expression of PPAR gamma and NLRX1 in macrophages, and we are trying to understand the mechanism and, and uh, what this inverse relationship means. And modeling was used to assess the sensitivities of our network to NLRs and their immunoregulatory mechanisms uh, during H. pylori infection. So that, that would be one of our uh, use cases uh, that uh, MIP has developed and uh, another use case that I'll touch on briefly relates to enterogregative uh, E. coli. EAEC is the leading cause of enteritis and persistent diarrhea worldwide. Uh, the high risk populations for developing EAEC are travelers, HIV infected individuals, uh, malnourished children. Uh, and uh, you can see here the frequencies of uh, diarrheogenic isolate frequency distribution, 41.1% uh, uh, is actually uh, EAEC. There are some uh, pathogenicity mechanisms that EAEC uses to cause pathology in the host that I'm not going to discuss here today. Uh, but our in vivo uh, marine model data suggested the beneficial role for TH17 cells uh, in general and IL-17A in particular. We've, we've studied uh, TH17 in the context of our CD40 cell differentiation model. Um, we used computational modeling to predict the effects of enhancing effector of cell populations during uh, EAC infection. What this slide shows you is again uh, the, the growth retardation associated with uh, EAC infection in wild type mice or mice lacking in this case pupar gamma in T cells and the different uh, histopathological uh, effects uh, associated with this uh, EAC infection. Those uh, changes in, uh, the, basically what we see is that mice lacking PPAR gamma have a more uh, accentuated TH17 response. And this accentuated uh, TH17 response, characterized by increased IL-6 and TNF-alpha um, expression, is, is associated with less lesions uh, in those mice. So what, what the data suggests is that uh, uh, when you have a, a more a stronger effective response, you may be able to clear EAEC infection uh, more effectively. We built a mathematical model much simpler than our comprehensive model of uh, CD40 cell differentiation that was linking EAEC and the different T cell subsets, TH1, TH17, uh, TREC. Uh, our model was able to reproduce uh, the effector and regulatory responses. And we asked the question as to whether um, the deficiency of uh, PPAR gamma in the system, what would be the effect in uh, modulating uh, EAC clearance? And our model suggests uh, that EAC clearance would be accentuated uh, following uh, antagonism or deletion of this gene. Uh, remember that in the macrophage slide that I uh, discussed earlier related to the H. pylori presentation, I alluded to GW9662. It's a potent antagonist of PPAR gamma. And uh, we decided to use this antagonist in the context of uh, EAC infection in order to block uh, PPAR gamma um, transcription 
and accentuate effector responses with the hope uh, to elicit the beneficial effect at the mucosal level, facilitating clearance of the pathogen. Um, administration of GW9662 promoted the upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, so it blocked pipar gamma, the blockage of pipar gamma uh, regulated IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, MCP-1, IL-17, and this was associated with lower levels of uh, EAEC in feces. And uh, how was this, uh, how would uh, the upregulation of a factor, uh, cytokines and the increase in TH17 responses be associated with lower levels of EAC following infection? Uh, and we saw a correlation of uh, effector cytokines and antimicrobial uh, peptide expression. So here we have uninfected mice, mice infected with EAC not treated with GW9662, uh, and mice infected with EAEC and treated with GW9662. And the levels of antimicrobial peptides were significantly upregulated. This upregulation was correlated with increased IL-6, TGF-beta, and IL-17. So this pattern was consistent with the uh, TH17 um, phenotype. We next asked, uh, whether IL-17A uh, uh, neutralization would have any effect on the beneficial effects of pipar gamma blockade. And um, what we used was an antibody that neutralizes IL-17A, and we had here three groups. Uh, a group that was infected and non-treated in red, a group that was infected and uh, treated with uh, GW9662, but also received a neutralizing antibody against IL-17A. And then we had the third group that was infected with GW9662, but did not receive the neutralizing antibody against uh, IL-17A. And what we see is that, as anticipated, the uh, blockade of pipar gamma and the more potent effector response associated with that blockade was able to result in a clearance of EAEC but uh, when, that, um, uh, when mice were treated with um, IL-17A neutralizing antibody, this effect was abrogated, suggesting that IL-17A mediated the beneficial effects of uh, GW9662 uh, in, um, in clearing EAC infection. So that would be another example of um, integrating some computational approaches and some experimental approaches to understand mucosal immunology in an uh, infectious disease setting. I wanted to spend uh, a few minutes discussing uh, the, the modeling platform that we've been uh, developing under uh, MIP and uh, We define this as a modeling environment. It's an agent-based modeling platform. Host cells and bacteria are represented as agents. Uh, the current level of scalability of our agent-based modeling is 10 to the 8 agents. Uh, our agents moved around the gut mucosa and lymph nodes. Um, the agents in the same location are considered to be in contact. The underlying uh, system that links the mathematical theory and high performance computing is co evolving graphical discrete dynamical systems. And contacting agents can interact as agent agent interaction, group agent interaction, uh, time uh, interaction. Each agent is represented as an automaton. Uh, this is a slide that I'm sure if Martin had not had to cancel, uh, he would have uh, presented. It's taken out of one of his papers, and it has been used throughout uh, this week uh, by various presenters. And it shows the need to integrate uh, modeling approaches, biological scales, and experimental approaches. And uh, our initial version of ANISI was not intended to be a multi-scale modeling platform, but now that we have the different parts uh, within the MIP program where we've developed CD40 cell differentiation models, macrophage differentiation models, uh, tissue level models of uh, mucosa, including high resolution representation of uh, the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the lymph nodes, uh, we believe that we may be uh, ready to move uh, from uh, an agent-based modeling environment to a more multi-scale uh, modeling environment where we have uh, an intracellular scale and you can imagine here the CD40 cell model that you have played with and uh, have learned about uh, during the week. Um, we can have a chemokine, cytokine, gradient scale 
uh, cellular scale and a tissue level scale, and they are at different times and uh, different space uh, scenarios. Uh, an EC MSM or an EC uh, multi scale modeling uh, will uh, uh, integrate uh, the tissue level phenomena, and we are particularly interested in lesion formation. We want to know about lesions. We want to know is edge pylori inducing epithelial erosion? We want to know is edge pylori inducing leukocytic infiltration? We want to know is the AEC inducing leukocytic infiltration or Clostridium difficile? And, uh, and so linking the lesions to the underlying immunology at the molecular and cellular level, we believe it's very important to fully understand pathogenesis and comprehend emerging uh, behaviors. Uh, here we, we are showing the, the, kind, the pathways within our CD40 cell model that lead to Th1, regulatory T cell or TH17 formation. And as you remember from the presentation on Monday, uh, these phenotypes are uh, very plastic, uh, very flexible. There was another presentation uh, showing bioinformatics approaches and how you can use bioinformatic approaches uh, to study the N17 uh, differentiation from uh, near yourself, some of those data sets we hope to be able to integrate in our modeling approaches. Uh, so an ECMSM will have an architecture where we have a, a basic engine, which will be our agent-based modeling uh, simulator, an EC. We'll have um, an ODE simulator, uh, COPASI or an ECSDE and uh, visualization uh, component, and I'll, I'll, I'm hoping that I'll be able to show you some of the visualizations of lesions that we have developed under this uh, platform. So, uh, in the case of our intracellular model, the initial implementation of the multi-scale modeling platform is going to uh, focus on uh, providing a higher resolution of what's going on in CD40 cells, since they seem to be quite critical uh, in uh, edge pylori. Uh, uh, related infection, Clostridium difficile and EAEC related infection. We have 94 species, uh, 46 reactions, 60 ODEs, and, uh, and we've been using so far a deterministic model for in silico experiments with the cell differentiation. Are we going to use our uh, large model of CD40 cell differentiation to connect in our multi-scale modeling platform? No, we are going to go through a model reduction process and we are going to integrate that reduced model in our multi-scale uh, modeling system. Uh, we are going to have the diffusion of cytokines and chemokines represented. Uh, the cell-cell interactions, uh, our laboratory is uh, doing a lot of flow cytometry. Uh, we, we get the mild or we get the peaks. Uh, we disassociate that uh, mucosa using enzymatic digestions and we are able to separate the epithelium from the lamina propria and then we utilize the cells extracted from the lamina propria uh, to run flow cytometry analysis in a way that we are able to effectively profile macrophage subsets, uh, T-cell subsets, dendritic cells, and so on. And so we'll be using that, those data sets as we've been using for the ODE and the ABM models to calibrate uh, such models. Um, the ANISI version 1, uh, the earlier version, the version that has already several pu publications out, uh, is uh, represented as a rule-based uh, automaton. And uh, the version uh, of an EC that we are calling an EC MSM will be able to uh, integrate in a hybrid modeling environment ODE and agent-based modeling uh, approaches. Um, and we'll have a tissue level scale where um, hopefully we'll be able to reproduce lesions and assess uh, the effect of uh, interventions. This was our initial attempt uh, to, to the visualization of, of lesions without on the left and with uh, chemotaxis on the right. And uh, you can see some clusters uh, that can represent uh, leukocytes uh, infiltrating the, the lamina propria forming. Um, and um, we've uh, gone uh, far from that 2D visualization, integrating the VisLead workflow in our uh, ANISI platform where we have the ANISI simulation engine, we have some post-processing uh, and a an, uh, silo file creation, and then we visualize uh, our data using uh, VisLib. And so our uh, system represents the epithelial barrier, 
we have a lamina propria where again that would be the, the effector side where the immune responses take place and we have the inductive side where the immune responses are um, initiated and um, I, I think I'll have to uh, move from So if we um, induce um, infection with uh, H. pylori, we are able to begin to reproduce some uh, lesions uh, in the lamina propria and uh, also in the epithelium that are consistent with the kind of lesions that we would expect to see in histopathological uh, evaluation. So that's the first step. We hope to uh, provide a higher level of granularity and better representation of these lesions. Uh, but this will allow us to overlay the underlying immunology that we are understanding at the single cell level, at the cell population level, at the cell-cell interaction level, and then uh, move to a tissue level uh, representation of, of lesions. Um, the sharing of our models happens through our um, website, uh, modelingimmunity.org. We've developed a tool called an EC Pathway Navigator, uh, which is an interactive modeling tool. The user has the ability to modify parameters and experimental setup uh, for the H. pylori model and simulate it on a high-performance computing engine, uh, Shadowfax. Um, we also provide the statistical results um, based on number of replicates, as it was alluded earlier today. Uh, the data that can be generated in modeling, particularly agent-based modeling, is more massive than the data, in some cases, going into creating that model. And I totally agree with Dr. Pierce, finding better ways to visualize that data, uh, particularly in real time, is going to be extremely helpful in order to extract uh, new knowledge from that data. That would be one of the annotations of our models uh, in uh, our website. And um, we've also developed a tool called an ECISC in silico experimentation, where uh, you can, uh, there's a model uploaded. I believe that this is the model of CD40 cell differentiation. You've been using this model in COPASI, but you can tweak uh, some parameters online. You can tweak the amount of external interferon gamma, external IL-12, IL-18, uh, TGF-beta, IL-6, IL-2, IL-4, and come up with the output as to how the model would behave, uh, what kinds of cells uh, you would get from these uh, different concentrations of cytokines. And uh, we hope to integrate our modeling platforms, Anisi and Popasi, in a larger modeling environment that is built on uh, high-performance computing uh, capabilities. Obviously, we have some HPC capabilities at DBI, we realize that as our modeling, um, agent-based modeling grows and, and we go from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 or beyond, we'll need additional uh, computing power uh, to examine, uh, to, to run the simulations and to examine the results. This is our website. I hope that you, you've seen this website during the course of the uh, summer school. Uh, there are some very useful tools. Uh, that you should uh, familiarize yourself both on the e-tools as well as agent-based modeling tools. We, all our models are being deposited at biomodels.net and they are also available on the MIP website. Uh, they are in SBML compliant format. And so if you want to uh, study CD40 cell differentiation and don't wish to reinvent the wheel, I encourage you to uh, download our CD4 model if you are interested in collaborating, we'll be glad to uh, have discussions with you and, and help you out. Um, this is the a slide. I'll have several acknowledgement slides. Uh, this is the acknowledgement slide for MIP. I'm uh, the director of, uh, of MIP and the PI of the project. Uh, Dr. Antetidas is the immunology lead of the project, and, and there's a group of people involved in uh, the immunological aspects of uh, modeling immunity to enteric pathogens. Dave Bevan, uh, you've interacted with him on a daily basis. He's the education lead of MIP, and, and he was instrumental in putting together the summer school and symposium. Uh, Madhav Marate, who gave a presentation on Thursday about multi-scale modeling. Uh, he's the director of MDSSL, uh, Network Dynamics and Simulation Science Laboratory, and is the modeling lead of uh, MIP. 
Stefan Books is the bioinformatics lead of, uh, of MIP, and we have uh, some collaborators at, at, uh, at UVA. As I said, I have other uh, acknowledgements. Uh, the first slide was the acknowledgements for the overall project. Uh, this slide is the acknowledgement for those people who have contributed uh, to putting together the summer school and symposium. Um, Andrew Carbo, a PhD student who uh, was, uh, has been leading the CD40 cell project and an H. Pylori uh, computational modeling project uh, was part of the education committee of uh, MIT. Uh, Kimberly Borkowski, uh, an administrative assistant at VVI, has uh, contributed greatly in making sure that uh, things go smoothly. I think that many of you have interacted with her for travel awards. Uh, Dave Evan, again, uh, educationally, Jim Walk, the project manager, uh, Kathy O'Hara, uh, was uh, involved in the design of the initial uh, phases of the education program. Noah Philipson, the manager yeah, in my lab. Uh, and then the education and uh, the communication and marketing team uh, has, uh, has helped us uh, in the marketing aspects of this and um, capturing what we are doing. Chris uh, Monger has been here on a daily basis. So I would like to thank uh, everyone. And finally, um, I want to thank uh, National Institutes of Health and our sponsors. Uh, there's, there's a reason, sorry, there's a reason why we have the sponsors in addition to the NIH. Uh, when the project was awarded, uh, we had a budget for uh, food. Um, now, in the middle of the project, uh, NIH changed the rules as to whether you can use food uh, from the grants and contracts, and so that was no longer an option. And so we engage uh, some institutes at Virginia Tech, uh, Cytobank, uh, Affymetrix, Bioscience, to help us support uh, the, the food aspects of, of this enterprise. And they have been uh, quite instrumental in, in allowing us to do it. So, uh, with that said, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you. Before we have questions, I know there are at least three of you who needed to get to the shuttle uh, to get to the or to get to the airport. Uh, so, if you want to go ahead and leave, because that shuttle leaves the Squires at uh, 5:20, and so you need to get your bags and get over there. Jim's going to drive you. Uh, so you're certainly welcome to leave at this point. Okay. So, questions for Joseph? How many of these models are translatable from one passage into another passage? So the, the question is, how can, can you translate the models from, from one pathogen to another pathogen? And, and the answer is it depends, obviously. Uh, what, what is, and, and we have made a deliberate decision to try to make our models of mucosal immune responses generic and portable. So there are some aspects that will move from pathogen to pathogen. And those aspects will relate to the general architecture of the model, the fact that you have compartments, you have a luminal compartment, an epithelial compartment, a uh, lamina propria, um, lymph nodes, where they are gastric lymph nodes or mesenteric lymph nodes, some of the underlying interactions that have been very well characterized and, and where there is a solid theoretical framework. For instance, a dendritic cell interacts with a naive T cell, and that naive T cell becomes a Th1. Or that dendritic cell interacts with an, another uh, naive T cell and becomes a Th2. Those aspects of the underlying immunology with some tweaking can move from H. pylori to AAC to Clostridium difficile. Obviously, there will be some pathogen-specific effects. Uh, we know that the mechanisms of uh, pathogenicity of H. pylori are slightly different than those of Clostridium difficile. Uh, Clostridium difficile produces toxins, and those toxins behave in a certain way. Some of them uh, get to the lamina propria, some of them stay in the epithelium. So we tweak those aspects. Uh, most importantly, what's different between these models are the data sets that we use to calibrate those models. Uh, to calibrate the CD40 cell differentiation model, we've been using a lot of uh, in vitro data, LISPOD, ELISA data, some gene expression data. To calibrate the H. pylori tissue-tissue uh, or, or cell-cell interaction model, tissue-level model, we've been using a lot of flow cytometry data 
per mice infected with Helicobacter pylori. Now, if we want to calibrate the model um, that represents Clostridium difficile infection, we would get those flow cytometry data sets from mice or other species infected with uh, Clostridium difficile. So there are some aspects that can be translatable and other aspects that cannot be translatable. And, uh, and that, that uh, seems to be common sense, but we hope that uh, the platforms we are building and the models uh, in the end will be uh, portable and applicable to other mucosal situations. Yes? Very nice talk, thank you, and just wonderful, incredible, amazing, mind-blowing tools you guys are bringing online. I'm so excited to learn them more. Um, I guess my question relates to sort of confidence in the data that we have that goes into our models. So, you know, there's this whole spectrum of data that you use in different types, and some you think probably a little more robust than other data sets. Is there like a built-in way to sort of um, overlay your confidence in the data that you're using to build your models in, these, in any of these frameworks? Yeah, so the question relates to the data used uh, for model calibration. And uh, before I answer the question, I, I want to say that the, the beginning of, of this program in uh, late 2010, for the labs, the immunology labs involved in this process to redefine the way experimentation was done. Of course, cost is a very important criterion and uh, those infection studies, immunological studies can be very expensive. So if, if you use the traditional immunology approach to define experimental design, you will likely be utilizing one or two time points to get a, a fast and easy immunological answer to an immunological question. And as a matter of fact, that will be accepted in most immunological journals. When we started the modeling, integrating immunology and modeling, we realized that that kind of experimental design was not going to be useful anymore that we're going to need uh, time for the studies uh, with more time points. And uh, many of those studies are actually not available in the literature. I know that NIH uh, is very proud of IMPORT, uh, the Immunological Database and Analysis Portal. And I think it's a great resource. Uh, MIP and other centers with the model immunity for biodefense are contractually obligated to put our data there. But if you look at import, you will not necessarily find those very beautiful time course data sets that you need for data calibration. So uh, I would say that for most of the tissue level models that we have constructed, we had to uh, start with uh, generating our own data and using our flow cytometry data to calibrate. As to uh, how confident we are uh, with those data sets, we, we believe that there are no better data sets for that H. pylori infection, not uh, with that level of granularity, with that scope of analy analyzing broad subsets of populations from dendritic cells uh, to T cells to macrophages. And ultimately, uh, the model predictions are predictions. What uh, we are really interested in is the model telling us new lines of emerging behavior, things that are not intuitive, that we will not be able to put together in our minds, and then validate it. So the ultimate way that we uh, assess the quality of the data that goes in the model is how meaningful uh, the predictions are, and can those predictions be validated? And we've had some success cases in validating those predictions. Um, I said earlier in the summer school, I don't want the MIP program, and I've uh, pushed everyone in, in the program very hard to not become an immunology program or a computer science program or a modeling program. I wanted the program to become a problem solving program. And, it, and, and, and I want the results of this modeling, integrated modeling experimental exercise to be, uh, have translational value. We want to be able to, uh, in this case, find out uh, in which situation we have H. pylori behaving as a pathogen, in which situation uh, is H. pylori behaving as a commensal, and we hope that down the road, the knowledge extracted from this project will help us possibly 
to reshape uh, the treatment regimens. Uh, perhaps in the future, if some of the predictions we have from this model are validated, the automatic response of physicians to treat someone infected with H. pylori will change and in some situations uh, with certain markers that automatic treatment with antimicrobials will not occur. So yes, it, it's a complex question and I'm sure it can be addressed in, in many different ways. Uh, the validation, the experimental validation or clinical validation ultimately is what's going to show the value of that model. We know that models are models, so they are incomplete. And, they, and at some point we are going to be able to demonstrate that the model is, is, is not holding true. But at that time, we are going to use the data that uh, demonstrates that the model is not robust enough in certain uh, components to improve that model and to refine it. And so it is the process and not the model itself where we are interested in. We are, we are interested in, in, in using the modeling process to extract new, new knowledge. We are not interested in developing models as final products of our research. Very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. First question is, if you have a, a, a co-infection, for example, if you look at the H. pylori infected mice or human, can you predict based on a model how the subsequent infection of C. difficile or E. coli will react, how the host will react to the subsequent infection? So, so the question relates to co-infection with uh, different pathogens. So, so you are saying H. pylori and then reinfected with C. diff. Yeah, so our current model is not calibrated to provide answers for what you just asked. However, I would say that modeling would be an ideal avenue to, um, to generate new predictions related to the um, immunological changes associated with co-infection and make predictions about uh, treatment uh, options in that co-infection state. My second question is the number of uh, data from different labs emerging that the type of microbiome that really the mouse has have profound influence on the type of host response for various infections and various different things. So, so the data that you have that, that the model is based on, on the type of microbiome you have, if somebody in a different lab produce a, a data, similar data from different sets of microbiome, do you think there will be a difference in post response and how we come, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, comprehend how that data and the model and your data and how we uh, come to find out exactly what is the real response is? Yeah, so the, I think that's a very important question and it relates to the um, relationship between mucosal immune responses and microbiome. And this is definitely a very hot topic. I think that Dan Liebman, uh, with his initial publication uh, with segmented filamentous bacteria and, and TH17 responses, uh, gave all of us a lesson uh, on, on modulation of immune responses by microbiome uh, one month ago. Uh, I don't know whether several of you went to AAI in Pittsburgh. The, the microbiome aspects surface not only in uh, what you consider enteric related uh, infectious disease research or immune mediated disease research where you fully expect uh, to, to have these kinds of discussions, microbiome related discussions were surfacing in the context of influenza infection or responses to influenza vaccination and there was very strong evidence demonstrating that the microbiome is critical in modulating the immune response and you are exactly right, the microbiome that we may have in the mouse colony across the street where, where we keep most of our 600 or 700 mice is going to be different from the microbiome in the vet school and that's going to be different from the microbiome at Harlan or Jackson and in fact there is data comparing the microbiomes from mice originated from Harlan, and, uh, Jackson, uh, Charles River and um, do we want to include the microbiome in our modeling approaches? Absolutely. I would say that uh, it's going to be relevant both including microbiome related networks at the clonic level as well as at the gastric uh, level. You know that uh, in the context of H. pylori infection, the level of a species that, that we have at the stomach is about 200 or so because it's a very severe environment 
not many bacteria can survive in that very acidic environment uh, of, of the gastric mucosa. And in that context, H. pylori is the dominant member. And, and so it, I think that we'll be able to get meaningful data, but I'll be most interested in incorporating the microbiome-related uh, modeling at the colonic level, when, for instance, we study Clostridium difficile infection or anterior gregative E. coli infection, where you have very complex interactions and you have networks and subnetworks, and uh, that becomes really a hard research uh, problem. Uh, I think we've, we've done some calculations. And our agent-based model is, is quite scalable. We are using the HPC capabilities here. But if we wanted to model the, the microbiome, we would need to increase our HPC capabilities quite significantly. That's doable. Or we need to connect uh, to a grid that is more powerful in, in terms of HPC uh, capabilities. Uh, we'll take one step at a time. And we are definitely interested. We, we believe that if we can uh, determine the linkages between the microbiome and the host at the epithelial layer or dendritic cells that are sensing that uh, microbiome that's sending their, their, their dendrites and then influencing the lamina propria and the inductive sites, we may uh, better understand the, the mucosal immune responses. Um, and that's another uh, scope and another component of the multi-scale modeling platform that I didn't include in my slide because at this time, if we included that, it, it would be probably awfully ambitious. But we are interested and it's a very good point. Well, it's time to close up this very busy week. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. Thank you.